Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Blade Runner 2049 is the new film everyone is talking about, the sequel to the 1982 sci-fi classic. Now, whether or not you've seen the original Blade Runner, you should because it's amazing and I'll like you more. We figured we could all use a primer on the old film. What is Blade Runner? Why is it considered great? What's the deal with the multiple versions of the film? And how does it connect to the new movie, Blade Runner 2049? Okay, for the uninitiated, let's start with the basics. What is Blade Runner? Blade Runner is a sci-fi noir film directed by Ridley Scott, adapted from a Philip K. Dick story, Do androids dream of electric sheep. It takes place in 2019 Los Angeles, starring Harrison Ford as Decker, a private detective called a Blade Runner who hunts down illegal rogue androids called replicants that are, for all purposes, identical to humans. The film is super moody and philosophical with different versions that have caused fans to debate over what exactly the film means. So here's where I cover our bases and warn you that if you haven't seen the movie, it would probably be best to watch it first. But the problem with that is, what version of Blade Runner should you watch? Okay, I personally would say the 2007 final cut. Now I say that because it's the only version that director Ridley Scott had full artistic control over, so for me it makes it the truest to the creator's intent. That's also, by the way, the version Blade Runner 2049 director Denis Villeneuve recommended to watch. That said, a version that made Blade Runner a huge influential hit in the 80s, a classic version most people saw, was the 1982 theatrical release. You could watch that too, just know what was later changed and why. And final spoiler warning here. So in Blade Runner, Deckard hunts down a number of escaped replicants. In his pursuit, he meets Rachel, an advanced new model of a replicant who believes she's human. She has memories as a young girl that were implanted in her mind. Later, after successfully tracking down and surviving the other deadly replicants, Deckard finds this origami unicorn on the ground. This recalls the earlier line from the cop baddie, Edward James Olmos. It's too bad she won't live, but then again, who does? Okay, here's where things change depending what version you're watching. The theatrical cut added a happy ending after Deckard and Rachel go into the elevator, showing them driving happily together with the credits rolling over these bright aerial shots and some new, kind of awkward narration from Harrison Ford. Tyrell had told me Rachel was special. No termination date. I didn't know how long we'd have together. Who does? The studio actually added lots of other narration from Harrison Ford, along with an explanatory opening crawl and this happy ending, all to clarify and contextualize the film after test audiences found an earlier version, in their words, confusing. And I said the studio because, yeah, this was not something Ridley Scott wanted to do. These aerial shots were actually given to the film by Stanley Kubrick. They were unused shots from The Shining. Some have even suggested that Ford acted the new narration poorly on purpose, even though he denies that rumor. Still, the film in this version became a cult classic, but years later someone discovered an old film print of a different cut of the movie. With Ridley Scott's approval, they assembled a 1992 director's cut, which removed Deckard's narration, ended the movie with the elevator door closing, and inserted this earlier Deckard daydream featuring a unicorn running through a forest. This shot gave a whole new meaning to the end of the film. The unicorn origami that Deckard finds, presumably left by Gaddy, is a reference to a vision that is only in Deckard's mind. So the fact that someone else knew about this unicorn and left him this little taunt suggests that Deckard's memories were implanted and that he too is a replicant. Ridley Scott has confirmed this interpretation of the film's ending, and his 2007 final cut keeps all these key changes in place. Now, Blade Runner 2049 is supposed to give us new insights about who or what Deckard is. Now, I won't be spoiling the movie in this video, to be honest, I haven't seen the movie yet, but it's fair to say that the ending of Blade Runner, regardless of what version you saw, is meant to be ambiguous. That mystery over what makes us human is really the central premise of the film. So let's quickly discuss what does Blade Runner mean. So the film opens with this interview called a Voight Kampf test. It's the personality test Blade Runners give suspected replicants to determine whether or not they're human. Now this is based on the real life Turing test where you test a computer to see if it can exhibit true artificial intelligence. Now the whole film of Blade Runner is essentially an extended Voight Kampf test. Deckard is tested to prove his humanity to us. As other replicants suffer and die around him, he discovers that they are, in many ways, more human than we are. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave.
And the very uncertainty that Deckard might be a replicant gives us the film's verdict on artificial intelligence and humanity. What does it matter if we can't tell the difference? The fact that not all of us are 100% on what this ending is means that the Turing test has been passed. Now, that theme has been hugely influential on the sci-fi film genre ever since. Recently, things like Westworld and Ex Machina clearly have Blade Runner in their DNAs. And it's not just the philosophy of the movie. The look and aesthetics of its grimy, futuristic, noir production design inspired the design of things like The Matrix, Ghost in the Shell, The Fifth Element, Children of Men, the reboot of Battlestar Galactica. And given how much Hollywood loves Blade Runner, it's no surprise that the franchise has been brought back to life. So what should we expect from Blade Runner 2049? Now, it's important to know that even though this is a sequel, this isn't so much a blatant Hollywood cash grab that sequels are known to be. The director is Denis Villeneuve, a visual genius behind the thoughtful, patient films like Arrival, Sicario, and Prisoners. In Arrival in particular, he crafted a sci-fi mystery with subtle visual clues that converge like puzzle pieces all at a precise moment. This guy deeply understands what Ridley Scott was aiming to do with Blade Runner, and he's not a fan of excessive dialogue, so don't expect any narration. But that's exactly why casting Ryan Gosling as the new Blade Runner, K, was so perfect. Gosling gives off this quiet, steely nerve seen in movies like Drive. His toughness is actually very similar to Harrison Ford's in the 80s. A cold exterior protecting a soft, boyish sensitivity. So to see these two men share the screen together is really exciting. It's almost like two editions of a toy trying to out-moody each other. What happens to the new model when an old model comes back? I'll show you, haunted kid. Which version of Blade Runner do you think is the best to watch as we prepare for 2049? Weigh in in the comments below or tweet me at EA Voss or follow New Rockstars at New Rockstars for updates on our videos. Like this video and subscribe to New Rockstars for more deep dives into the films you love. And yeah, keep an eye out for our review of Blade Runner 2049. All right, thanks for watching. Bye.